the most important of all the tribes, the Mexicans or Aztecs, although the last to choose a permanent resting place, had been as long in the valley as any of the sister nations. They proceeded from Aslan, an unknown region of the north. and reached Anahua about 1195. So it's talking about these Meshia Khans, these tribes of Meshi, Moshe, you know, coming from the north. And again, <laughs> we know they flipped our map so they can easily be talking about the south, you know what I'm saying to us, but we're going to talk north, you know, we're going to talk a lot of the Tecumseh War that went all the way north through Canada, you know what I'm saying, all the way back to, you know, Prophetstown and Tippecanoe, I'm talking Indiana, Illinois, but I just want to make this point, my knock, that they ain't saying you coming from Africa, God. <laughs> they ain't saying these tribes of Moshe, these tribes are coming off a boat uh, over these, you know, Atlantic super ocean, nah, man. You, you came from the north, it's talking about. <laughs> from what the migration is that they can try to piece together, but really, you know, we are original to all these parts. Don't let them tell you that you're just coming from Africa, but like it, they came from the north an unknown region of the North. So they can't even tell you even that much of, they can't tell you nothing more. <laughs> and reach Anahawak in 1195. And this is Preston John installment number 87. We popping off. I'm putting a timeline together. I'm looking at this 1195. We've been talking 1165, Preston John. Genghis Khan rolling up on Preston John 1202, 1203, right? We're taking an indigenous perspective into the Preston investigation, you know, through the eyes of the Kumsay mostly, you know what I mean? We're also going to be talking, um, you know, uh, some more of that Shikamagwa talk. Some more treaty talk, some Kanka Key River talk, some damn damn talk. Cause damn, they jammed up the flow. Unknown regions, right? Having made three stations at which the ruins of Casa Grandes are still to be seen. Their first halting place was on the shores of the lake Tegu yo or te gua yo, probably identical with the lake of Timpanagos or Great Salt Lake in Utah. Mm. So that's when they first posted up. That's their first halting place. So they're coming out these unknown regions and they first post up right there in Utah. <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, are we seeing clearly? So they post up in Utah. The second was on the River Gela, G-I-L-A. The third was not far from Presidio de los Llanos. So those are the, those are the three stations they're saying they have made. A hey, shout out to the bro Skywalker. 47, man, on IG, dropping that drop. La, wah. We just talking messy guns, right? Gun, gun. After reaching the plains of the lakes, the messy guns led a nomadic existence for 130 years. After a series of unsuccessful encounters in which their numbers were greatly diminished. They laid on the islands of the lake, the foundations of their city, t na in 1325, reduced to extreme poverty and hated by surrounding, surrounding nations. 
Mm. Who does that sound like? They resolutely strove against ill fortune until they became numerous and powerful enough to take offense. So now they're taking offense, they then spread desolation and slavery through many of the tribes who in former days had shown them little mercy. Sound like the Bible, sound like the script. You're going to take them into captivity whose captivity you were in. So they spread desolation and captivity <laughs> through many of these tribes who in former days had shown them little mercy. Their capital was extended and beautiful to an extraordinary degree. They soon became the equals of the Tezcucans. Tezcucans, in the cultivation of the arts and sciences, their institutions, customs, religion, and even their language were propagated wherever their power reached. The adjacent territories were invaded and occupied by Aztec garrisons. The Tezcucans were perhaps more advanced in knowledge and refinement than the Mexicans, but the latter, the Mexicans, were certainly far more powerful. And they gave their name to the whole country and to the civilization of their day. So, you know, this author's like, yeah, maybe these Tezcucans had the drop. Maybe they had the knowledge, but they didn't have the power. <laughs> they didn't have the power. No one told you you came from, you know, that these uh, Mexicans are coming on a boat from Africa, right? <laughs> this is 14th century, 13th century talk. Love the Skywalker 47. This, this Mexican nation was so powerful that the whole country had its name. They gave their name to the whole country. And to the civilization was named after the Mexican, the Mexican, the Mex. So when you see these old maps of America and it says Mexican and, you know, Mexico, pretty much the whole map. Up to the Templar showed a great map where all the way through North America, it just said Mexicans, man. Reminds us of, of that Josephus flow. that Josephus flow, right? You got the links, let's go. What did Josephus say about this, about these Mexicans, right? <laughs> Remember how he started with this genealogy of the grandchildren of Noah. He goes into Japheth, Japheth, and all these tribes that he's squeezing in until he gets to Moshekini, were founded by Mosak. He's going to give a whole mystery around this, and I want to compare this mystery <laughs> with this mystery of these Mexicans from this unknown region. But they were so powerful that they gave their name to the whole country, right? These Mesh. Mesh, <laughs> founded by Moshak, Moshak, remember Moshak, the founder, now called the Cappadocians, there's also a mark, a sign, a mark, a mark, right, a sign, <laughs> we just talking, the lost tribes of Israel, God. And we're just talking Israel talk, you know. We're talking Presta talk. So, you know, Presta means priest. We're talking priests. We're talking prophets. We're talking prophet town. You know, these leaders during this captivity, the Babylonian exilarchs, man. That's what we've been talking about. David Sauslands and then Roger and Roger Cholas. We come a long way with our David talk, our David conversation. 
we're talking Moses because Moses is a prester. Moses would be a prester John, priest, king. John means king, prester means priest. There's a mark on their ancient denomination. Right? There's also a mark of their ancient denomination still to be shown, to be shown. So something in the future will be shown concerning these tribes of Mosak or these Meshe, Meshi, Meshikas, still to be shown. For there's even among them now, them a city called Mazaka, which may inform those that are able to understand. <laughs> We've been going through this and back through this and bringing more substantiating recon and going back through this because we want to be able to understand, understand, and overstand. So <laughs> that so was the entire nation once called. Then he leaves the conversation after dropping these Mysterious gems, if you're able to understand, those that are able to understand, there's an ancient mark on their denomination <laughs> that's still to be shown. If you're able to understand, he say, he's crying out, man. Josephus trying to squeeze this in. He's crying out, man. He's trying to let us know the drop. But what's the drop? Josephus trying to let us know the drop, but Managa was the drop. <laughs> I mean, are you able to understand that so was the entire nation once called? When you dig on Meshiachai, when you dig on Mosak, the founder, see? It's all coming together, man. When we're talking Byzantine history, Native American history, Hebrew biblical history, bring in the Mongol history, and it's really popping off. What do we get out of that? Uh, Coming Christian <laughs> conversation of Roman Cappadocia. In his ecclesiastical history, Philostrosius was hence both ecumenical and local. He included many tidbits of odd information about biblical events in the Roman Empire and was interested in legends about Cappadocia. When he mentioned Mazaka, the original name for the city that eventually became Kazari. Eventually became Kazari. He noted that this name was derived from Mosak, the founder of the Cappadocians. Mosak's name suggests some sort of schematic derivation, meaning that the name is coming out of the tribe of Shem. Wink, wink, for those that are able to understand is a mark on the ancient denomination still to be showed, says Josephus. This schematic, semantic derivation and his reputation as the founder of the Cappadocians seems to hint at a foundational legend, a legend at the foundation 
of all the mythology. Mosak's name suggests some sort of shamanic derivation. This hints at a foundational legend for the region for the region that was older than Greek myths, man. So whatever, when you, when you talk foundational legend, you're predating Greece, right? You're predating their Greek gods. You pre, you pre, you're predating their mythology, their mythos, right? And the early Roman emperor, empire people outside of Cappadocia had heard of Moses, had heard of Mosa. The Jewish historian Josephus even tried to fit him into biblical genealogy which is what we just read, that Josephus came out of nowhere and started talking about, you know, this entire nation was once called Moses. The entire nation was once named after this foundational legend that predates Greek mythology. Moses is a foundation to this uh, American, this, you know, entire puzzle but it's only the validation that our creator exists and the people of our creator exist and look at how they had to change the name if it didn't exist and there was no threat why does the name of israel have to be in remembers and remembers no more you know why has it been cut off why have we been cut off? Once upon a time. Once upon a time, this entire nation, so was the entire nation once called. We're talking Mazaka, right? Huh? The mark on their ancient denomination. Mosa? Founder of Cappadocians and the Mosakini. <laughs> right, the Meshi, the Meshika. These are the Mexica tribes of Peru. These are the Mexica tribes of Mexico. So we're talking Chicamagua in the 1700s because they're named after a river of death. But before the 1700s, going all the way back, back 1400s and before that, you got the tribes of the Preston, man, the tribes of Meshi, the Meshi, Shini, Kini, Kana, Meshikana, Mesho, Meshi, Kana, which became through a swerving Mazaka and Cappadocia and Kazaria, very important for those that are able to understand. And so is the entire nation what's called yeah we're talking mexico right josephus tried to fit him in a biblical genealogy by equating him with meshach one of the grandsons of noah although moses Mosak is an intriguing primal ancestor. So first he's being called foundational legend. Now he's being called primal ancestor, right? <laughs> he unfortunately remains completely obscure. So what did they do to make sure the name is no more in remembrance? Philostrogus, in fact, knew so little about the legend that he could not match up the consonants and vowels in order to make sense of the postulated link between the city's name of Mazaka and Mosak's name. So he accidentally just lost. He accidentally dropped the ball. He couldn't link up the consonants and vowels. Really, man? That's one story. Or <laughs> so he shrugged and invented a makeshift phonetic transfer. So he. <laughs> In order to get out of Moses, Mosak, he made a phonetic transfer. 
And after the passage of time, the city was called Mazaka through a swerving. You think it was an accident? Or did he purposely switch the frequency so that you can't connect Mazaka with Moshe? Because Mosak looks too much like Moses, right? Let's do Mazaka. And then let's do Kazari and Cappadocia. Let's just change it completely because we can't let them know. There's a foundational legend here connecting this Byzantine. That was wiped out one year after the Papal Bull Doom Diverses in 1453. In the later Roman Empire, all that survived of whatever legends there were, there may have been about Mosak were his name. Well, you don't remember Mosak, but you might remember his name as Moses his reputation, you know, there's a lot of movies being made about Moses, right? <laughs> and his enigmatic, enigmatic connection with the name of the city. The myth of Mosak the founder was a lost memory, a fragment of an abandoned past. Why is this connection this founder this foundational legend why is moses a lost memory because now you look at moses and you say oh that's some you know that happened before the birth of jc i mean that that happened way back in the bcs right <laughs> it's a fragment of an abandoned past It's a lost memory, because if you connected it with Mosak, the founder, your timeline might get at least an 1800 year chronological time shift. You might start getting them time shifts back and your Moses might be popping up, uh, you know, 1100s, 1200s. Thirteen hundreds, my nights. <laughs> I mean, we could play around with it now. The imposition of Roman rule, expansion of Christianity, this became the casualty of Moses, of Mosak, the founder, as anything you would remember, because now it's a lost memory, a fragment of the abandoned past, my night. The go. You know, a lot of things are lost memory, right? Just like uh, our creator. <laughs> the name of our creator. You know, we on that play play now. We call our creator everything, but we forgot about the ah, and we forgot about the wow. I'm in that press to pack. Make sure you pre-order that press to pack too. They will be dropping next week, going out. Hey, how to all my noggers? in the drop shop, click the links below. Let's go. Yeah, I mean, a lot of things are a distant memory, a fragment of the abandoned past. A highly prominent name is that of Hawa. It was the most ancient name for the creator. And is easily identified from a Hebrew verb meaning to form. So we say framer and shaper, just like the Papu Vu. Your mama, who is the breath, who is that Ruach that provides the elements, the ingredients to frame, to form to shape as your father is the shaper whose vibration and frequency it is whose code it is that shapes you without that code you have no shape you have no frame you have no form 
frame it and shape it. Yeah, now it's just Father God, right? Christianity 101, forgot about mama. Now she's just wisdom. Earthly mama, right? Hawa is the most prominent name, the most ancient name for the creator. And it's easily identified, easily identified from a Hebrew verb. When we say Hawa, we in the ancient paleo Hebrew. We're speaking action. We're talking verb, the action of <gasps> Wow. Every breath is an action that leads to action, that leads to you dropping up. Fighting with one breath, with one vibe, with one mind. Hawa is an ancient Hebrew verb, meaning to form or to mold. As time flowed on and the world fell apart, different people developed different names for the Father God. Uh oh. For the creator God, a God, a king of the gods, and for other superhuman personalities. The myths show common patterns, but the stories and relationships among the gods vary from place to place. The tribes remembered the same general arrangement, but estrangement led to different details, oral, oral deterioration, and later literary embellishments eroded a solid core of social memory. The myth of Mosak, the founder, was a lost memory. Oh, was it by accident? You know, Philo couldn't match up the consonants and vowels. Or was it purposefully done in this Greek Roman expansion in Christianity to a swerving, a purposeful, purposeful swerving for them? to get you to no longer remember a fragment of the abandoned past. They've done this with our priest Khan, whether we're talking David or Moses, they pushed it so far back in the BCs, they made a fragment of an abandoned past, a lost memory. They no longer remember Hawa. Ain't that's what it say, cause a wise everywhere. El Hawa, El Oa, the name, Hebrew name for Hawa, for what they call God, right? Oh, then he got a new name, Yahweh. Y'all believe it? Which Yahweh backwards? Hawa. <laughs> They're reversing everything. Yeah. Eloha, Hawa, Allah, Al Hawa, El Hoa, Al Hawa, Al Hua. All these have Hawa's name. Ak El Hawa, Ok, Ok. Man. Ka Bab Al Hawa is one of the most ancient excavated sites in Israel, El Hawa. God creator, El Hawa, is the key to a host of linguistic forms, while El, a common Shemitic word for God, is well remembered in the Bible. Hawa, the ancient name. So they tell you straight up, and look at the trickery in the next line. First, he's going to say it's the ancient name. The ancient name for the creator is not remembered. Oh, because a new name was given. So now <laughs> the 
The reason is simple. When the Israelites were given Yahweh, wow. So y'all still putting the Yah on the Hawa? Y'all still on y'all Yah Hawa? Just know that so is the hijack, man. <laughs> so is the hijack. Why would Hawa need a new name? If Hawa is the ancient name that is no more remembered. They say, oh, it's the, it's the, it's the tense, bro. You know, the Yah makes it futuristic. What other name do you put a Yah in front to get a futuristic name? The name carries a frequency, carries a code. I'm not gonna name carries a vibration. Are you in it? It's an ancient love song to it. You changing the frequency from a ha to a ya, which we already got connected to an exclamation of defiance and etymology. They're on the Yahwahs, Yahweh's, and all that Yahuwah. The creator never asked you to put a ya in front of your <gasps> breath. Your breath is the beginning. What's the confusion? You got all this drop, but you can't let go of the hijack vibration. Their Yah is not your Yud. You know, we have a, a righteous Yud, <laughs> a righteous Yah, and then there's the one that they're trying to replace the breath with. You have a Yud, right? you know, throw, worship. The creator's name is not throw and worship. You don't put that in front of your breath, man. Work, the creator's name ain't work. The creator puts in the work, but the breath <sighs> is your revelation. Does the work come before the revelation or does the revelation come before the word? Why not add the ya at the end? Ha, wa, ya, right? I mean, why not? Because they want to hijack the frequency. They're not speaking ya as in yud. They're speaking ya as in defiance, which is why the hijack is kicking in. Why the hijack can't just say, Hawa is the ancient name, return to Hawa. Uh, the Israelites were given Yahweh during the Exodus, the new name. Oh, now we got a new name. Is that facts? They learned to forget the old. Someone taught them to forget the old Hawa. Is that what we say, IJ? Or is Hawa's name no longer in remembrance, man? Which is why you're on your Yahs. Because they know longer remember a wah but a wah is everywhere a la wah a la wah a wah is everywhere right hawa 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 is a wah hawaii hawu awe hua hawa h-u-a hawa Everywhere, so why? What do you mean you forgot? What do you mean? How could you forget? Then the world is named after Hawa, <laughs> just like we got with this entire nation of Moshe, Meshi, Moshak, the founder, Mosak, the founder, right? Ah, ah, Hawa, Hawa, River in Nicaragua. Can't make this up. Ki hawa hawa. Hawa hawa forms in Mexico. We're talking the Mexicans. 
Hawa Hawa H U E is pronounced Hawa Hawa. So when you see H U E, it's still Hawa Hawa. Hawa's name is everywhere connected with the Meshia Khan. <laughs> or are we just talking Meshia. But what we do know, dodging all hijacks, what we do know is that these place names aren't Yahawa, are they? So you still need to put a Yah in front. You really got to check your frequency, man. It might be more ego and pride. Because Hawa, the ancient name, is the ancient name. They no longer remember Hawa. Wow. The myth of Moses, the founder, was a lost memory, <laughs> a fragment of an abandoned past, a casualty of the adoption of Greek mythology, the imposition of Roman rule, or the expansion of Christianity, or all three. All three is one and the same. In a society that defines itself in Greekness and Romanness or Christianity, Mosach, the founder, had become meaningless because they no longer remember Moses. They pushed him to the BCs. They no longer remember Hawa. They no longer remember Hawa. Yeah, but they say it all the time, right? <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> yeah. It's time flowed on. The world fell apart. Different people develop different names for the creator. Eroded a solid core of social memory, but Hawaii is the most prominent name, the most ancient name for the creator, but they no longer remember Hawaii. They no longer remember Hawaii. They no longer remember Moses, you know, I'll praise the why, you know. What did the creator say? What happened to us? You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will visit you. That means you're going to get this work because of all your iniquities. And then what happens? You get a confederacy on your head bone. What is that confederacy brand? Treaties, right? They make a covenant with one consent to cut you off from being a nation, Israel, Yahshua. They took counsels against you, treasured ones. Remember, you only have I know. They took counsel against you. They said, nah, I don't like that. They cut us off so that the name of Israel will be remembered no more, be no more in remembrance. Yeah, they no longer remember Hawaii. Why would they remember you if they don't remember Hawaii? Why would they remember Moses, Mosak, the founder, if they no longer remember you? If you no longer remember you and no longer remember the creator, Hawa. Come and let us cut them off from being a nation. That the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance, my knock. And this is where we're at. <laughs> This is where we're picking up from, remembering, returning. What does it say? Hosea 3. And after you've been solitary because of all your harlotry, right? You sat solitary many days. You shall not play the harlot, my God, no more. For the children of Hashrah 
shalt sit solitary many days without all your stuff. No king, no prince, nothing to second. You don't have nothing, right? You're just a Negro, right? You're black, right? Black power, right? But afterwards, which means there is an afterwards, which means there is a remnant, shall the children of Israel start to remember again, remember Hawa, remember the priest Ka, return, remember your name, and seek Hawa. That's what you do when you remember. And to see Kawa means you keep the code. Exodus 20, God is in code. God. You follow the code. You remember the code is in your heart bone. No power before your power. No covetous, no adultery. Your honor, your ama abba. Keeping your Shabbats, no killing, no stealing. My naga, you back in cold, right? That means you seeking Hawa. And once that is at a point that Hawa knows your heart, now he now Hawa knows your heart because you're seeking. And then something in you says, "Man, what's up with Mosak the founder? <laughs> what's up with?" Dawi, what's up with the priest king? What's up with the prester? Because now you're seeking Hawa and David, your king. Because you're in cold. Now you're ready to flow. Now you're ready for the shepherd, right? The Meshe, the Meshiach, the Meshe, the Moshe, huh? You shall come trembling unto Hawa into his goodness in the end of days because you return which means my naga you remember we remember we remember Hawa because they no longer remember Hawa but we in cold man we seeking Hawa and David let's get it So was the entire nation once called Mosak. Mark on their ancient denomination. Okay, Josephus. Okay. This is a book, Love Doc Watai dropped this a while ago. I believe we might have it in the drop, in the drop library. I wouldn't be surprised Aqua is the record keeper, man. Tragedy, Biography, and Oration by George Jones. And he's, you know, getting into the Tecumseh flow, you know, like not too many people are willing to do. Yeah, this is an old document, man. You want the recon? Well, here it is. Tecumseh and the Prophet of the West, an historical Israel. Indian tragedy, man. I mean, who's putting that together? You know, not too many authors. This is 1842. Uh-oh. You know, a lot's happening. This is about 30 years after the death of the Kumsay. So this is right there. I'm going to jump right there. I'm going to jump right into it. In the preface... The courteous reader in tracing the fate of Tecumseh as depicted in the following pages would not fail to observe the strong analogy between the religious sentiments of the chief of the force and those of the ancient Hebrews. Hmm. Here we go, right? Because I'm not saying it. <laughs> Managa, this is George Jones and around 1842. Right, and this is a big point, man. Whoever's confederate, whoever's confederate against us, 
holding crafty converse against your people, your treasure was, boy. Please believe it's all happening, and it's all happening in this Takumse war. This Takumse <laughs> has this connection with the ancient Hebrews, you see. They try to dog Takumse out, man. Oh, man, he ain't won no war, man. Who's this guy supposed to be, man? We ain't following you, man. And on the other side, you have them saying, man, this this nugget here, you know, uh, when it came to navigating the field of battle, is unlike any other. When it came to speaking to the tribe and the frequency and leading the tribe, unlike any other, along with his brother, the prophet, Ten Skatawa. Let's go. Let's read about it. <laughs> so the courteous reader in tracing the fate of Tecumseh as depicted in the following pages will not fail to observe the strong analogy between the sentiments of chief of the forest or the sentiments of Tecumseh. He's the chief of the forest, my naga. And those are the ancient Hebrews, the language that's uttered by Tecumseh. While it may be attributed to the brain of the author, yet are the religious ideas not written by the pen of fiction. So the author say, you know, you know, while we're, you know, putting together this dialogue and, you know, giving you whatever coloration to it, the idea itself and the religious ideas are not, you know, this is based on a true story <laughs> to uphold a visionary theory, but they are gathered from the archives of the people's history. Wow. All right. To support a theory of a apparent truth and reality from mature and conscientious, conscientious reflection. I cannot yield to any man in my firm belief. Listen up. This is his thesis throughout the whole book. My firm belief that the Aborigines, the originals of North America and the ancient Israelites are identical So they came over here and they put slaughter, mutilation, and genocide on the actual tribes of Israel, my God. And that's a big point and a tough pill for the hijack to swallow. Because not only do you have to worry about the bloodshed of, you know, Indians, <laughs> you know, innocent, you know, natives, right? But these natives are the children of Israel, man. And when the hijack really realizes, are we over here in Beverly Hills flaunting our Lamborghinis or we over here getting, a, you know, a fresh start at life? We getting land and homes already built. Everything's beautiful. You're taking the Israelite homes. You're taking Israelite lands. You're slaughtering Israel, man. And the payback for that is just, uh, I can't even tell you. It's astronomical, man. It makes things very uncomfortable for this hijack. They can't go back to Europe. They don't have nowhere else to go. <laughs> it ain't all peaches and cream for them anywhere no more, right? So that now, now they just got to act like you don't exist. Now they got to act like you just black. You come from Africa, you know. They're not going to tell you you're the children of Israel. Man. <laughs> and they can't tell these children of Israel where they from. They can't tell you, hey, hi, children of Israel. We've been looking forever for you. Matter of fact, we've never seen anything like you before. <clears throat> Shalak, we ain't seen nothing like you before, man. He said, I cannot yield to any man in my firm belief that the Aborigines of North America and the ancient Israelites 
are identical. They ain't seen nothing like you before, boss. I need you to really see clearly with me, man. Races of men, right? Robert Knox, I believe, offered the credulous for the people in North America, always accepting the standby of the thoroughbred theories, namely that the Copper Indians, that is, the true Americans, are, were, are <laughs> the lost tribes of Israel, headed by Preston John. God. Let's just stick to the facts. Who fled over here? You don't know what they did, man. You don't know the story, but you do know the following the Preston. They're following the, the Meshi, the Moshi, the Meshiach, the following a, a, a shepherd, my not. Keeping the cold, following that Dawi flow. The kind of cons flow. So whereas George Jones in the book, The Kumsan, the Prophet of the West and Historical Israel Indian Tragedy breaks down right in your face, Paul, that the Kumsan <laughs> is an ancient Hebrew that his belief, he said, I cannot yield to any man in my firm belief, right? That these Nagas of, of America are the ancient Israelites, man. They're identical and less com controverted by the stern authority of superior historical de de <laughs> deductions. <laughs> For that belief is founded upon the features of form and sight or physio physiognomy as well as religion customs and language man so my firm belief is founded on the features of form and physiognomy as well as religion customs and language this is why i'm making my historical deductions <laughs> he said man only way you can knock me off of this is if you have controverted by some other stern authority of superior historical deductions, but you ain't going to find this because <laughs> my belief is rooted in religion, customs, and language. So George Jones is kicking the real that these aborigines of North America and ancient Israelites are identical. Robert Knox and the races of man is kicking the real that the true Americans, the copper Indians were the lost tribes of Israel following Preston John. Say it with me, man. And yeah, so we got George Jones kicking the real, Robert Knox kicking the real for the trifecta. You also got Godfrey Sykes in the mythical straits at Ania kicking the real. <laughs> Letting you know that in the British Museum, developing the idea further, we're talking Marco Polo's kingdoms. After the discovery of the mainland north of the Isthmus, we find that the maker of the MS map illustrated in outline has placed Prester John not far from Mexico. Right? So we got this. And we blew this up. You can see this even clear. Go get all the drops. So this is at the British Museum in 1530, right? So Godfrey Sykes is putting Preston John right, right in the heart of India Superior, North America, near Mexico. Got it. Got it. 
Robert Knox is letting you know <laughs> that the following the Prester, who Godfrey Sykes put right by Mexico, letting you know that the following the Prester, these Copper Indians, and that they are the tribes of Israel. And George Jones is telling you to your face, bone, man, look, I got a firm belief that these originals of North America are the ancient Israelites. <laughs> I can't make this up, right? I can't make this up, right? We're talking tech, right? And they ain't never seen nothing like you before, boss. I mean, what did he say up here? In that land, these great men found nothing to resemble strictly the countries they had left. They didn't find nothing over here that, th that they had over there, man. No trees, shrubs, no fish or birds, nothing which lived. Nothing which lived, my naga. So they, when they're saying you're the children of Israel, they're also saying that we don't have you like this over there right not that we ain't over there in our own pockets our own flow but Managa, this is nagaville right nothing which live resemble you know what it is that they ever knew that they ever you know could fathom you know that they ever could contemplate i had better say nothing was identical with the productions of the old world or their world man was there no doubt but he was not identical with any other race in his mental qualities body qualities this Naga over here is not identical with this Naga over there. <laughs> but whoever these people are, they're following Preston John. They're the lost tribes of Israel. <laughs> whoever these people are, according to George Jones, these Aborigines are the ancient Israelites. They're identical. Identical Indian and Israelites. I've introduced in several parts of the tragedy. It's a tragedy because you put genocide on Israel, man. The mention of those were more solemn customs, which are in direct analogy with those of the ancient Israelites. Wow. <laughs> the reader of the Bible will instantly detect them for it would be an insult to the Christian community were I to point them out in detail. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. All knowledge of the Savior by the Aborigines is derived from the missionaries, man. So we didn't know about this Yahawashai business. We weren't rocking with OJC. All knowledge, not some. All knowledge of the Savior, their Christ, was derived from the missionaries. On a mission, the mercenaries. And the former often allude to Christ in order in their eloquence to impress their arguments with the additional force upon the Anglo-Saxon race. <laughs> you got this drop, hey, make sure you dig on it fully if you want the full story, man. We, we're going to jump right in. We're going to continue to jump right in. You know, I'm over here belly flopping through this. There's all kinds of goodies I want to point out quickly in this joining. We're going to keep the investigation flowing and press the John investigation number 87. So here's when they start introducing this Harrison, right? This Harrison that we've been talking about. 
looking at him, you know, from a couple of different angles here. You know, one of the angles. Was this William Henry Harrison, principal chief of the Choctaw, right? And through his line all the way up, you know, to this Louisa. You know, you follow this Louisa, you'll follow her, her bloodline all the way up to the sister of Pushma Taha. We're going to dig more on this whole situation. Yeah, we're going to have some fun with this push situation, man. So, you know, you also have President William Henry Harris, also known as Old Tippecanoe, where the battle was fought. The battle was, you know, eventually lost, man. But they, they played dirty, man. They they attacked the prophet without the Kumse being there, knowing the Kumse wasn't going to be there. Then they acted like the prophet is the one who, you know, teased them, you know, uh, mocked them to to go into war with them because he was jealous of his brother. Oh, that, that, that's their story. They're sticking to it. They knew what they were doing. They felt like they were weaker without the Kumse while he was rallying the tribes, trying to get the tribes to fight back, not take these goodies that they were so happy to get but to fight back, not make no more deals, not give up no more land, like the Treaty of Fort Wayne, 30 million acres. William Harrison, right? Of all the presidents of the United States, Harrison, from his early education and natural taste, had the most perfect knowledge of classical literature in which education like Washington and Tecumseh says was directed by the mother, the father of each of these great men having died in infancy or early youth of their, of their children. Harrison had so perfectly embedded the spirit and the language of the ancients that all his actions documents contain that spirit and often his language, his language his language was adorned with figures derived from the pages of Greece and Rome. So he was so eloquent. He was perfect. You know, because he was the one that got pushed Mataha, you know, really into these treaties. You know, he was really that guy. Tukumse was against Harrison, was against Push Mataha and anybody down with him, right? I have not, therefore, in the text given Harrison's words or figures that he would not have said but have endeavored to illustrate his character with the same truth as that at the Combs say <laughs> general harrison in the negotiations with the indians always addressed them in the same style of language as they spoke themselves which was one of the secrets of his power with the Aborigines. Man, let's go, man. Let's go. So we see this author's viewpoint. He's proving the Israel Indian connection, right? And we did a few drops on this in the past. Go get it. And they have their whole, uh, they really have it set up. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, these. You know, pretty much like these scenes that they're trying to put together this dialogue to give you a clear picture of the backstory. So I suggest you really get into this, man. We might have to, we might have to put this play on, man, because <laughs> it's pretty good dialogue. But just, you know, I'm going to leave it for you. You get it. I'm skipping ahead right here. To the notes historical and biographical notes illustrative of the tragedy of Tecumse and the prophet of the West. You know, uh, it's giving you some notes on 
page one by the memory of Matt Anthony from the continual successes. See if we can get this part bigger. Continual successes of General Anthony Wayne against the Indians. Is that what I call the Treaty of Fort Wayne, man? After General Anthony Wayne, man. And he was thought by the latter to be possessed by a devil, mm. <laughs> which they believed to be the cause of madness. So they believed that this Wayne was possessed by the devil. The scripture contains many instances of this belief of the Hebrews. <laughs> okay, they, they bringing it together, man. The scripture contains many instances of this belief of the Hebrews. Let's keep going. Okay, they got Manitou, man, Manitou, the name of our supreme God. They are with the two races of men, but synonymous terms. Interesting. So they're translating the supreme power and their language as Manitou, also okay. Excuse me, I'm just belly flopping, you know, just catching a few key points, man, because, you know, we're we going to need it all. We're going to need it all, man. The affection of Tecumseh for the memory, memory of his maternal parent amounted to filial adoration. What other proof is required of the noble heart of Tecumseh? There never yet was a bad man who regarded with deep affection the memory of a mother. The rude asperities, asperities of our nature are softened by filial piety in the same manner as our worldly thoughts become less harsh and sordid when governed by the higher qualities of religion and a consequence of philanthropy. I have ever hesitated to form even an acquaintance, even a acquaintance with a man or acquaintance with a man who should speak harshly of a woman of woman, but I have with alacrity, alacrity endeavored to secure the friendship of that man who should view a mother with filial affection. For I have felt convinced that the friendship would be lasting and I have never been deceived. The Indians of North America possessed a species of hereditary secession. The son or daughter may succeed the father as chief of the tribe, provided he or she has ability and courage for the battle and the powers of mind and oratory necessary for the councils of the nation. This policy, excellent in its intellectual results, <clears throat> excuse me, forms a medium between the perfect hereditary secession and its total ab abolition. It was the abuse of power or rather the inability to govern that caused the ancient Israelites to seek of Samuel the removal of his sons, Joel and Abiah, from the joint judgment and to nominate the first king of Israel that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. This is what they were asking. And that's when they got Saul. Then Saul ruled them as a king. And Hawah gave them a Khan. And David was anointed. This is the exact duty of the sovereign chief of the northern tribes at this day. So you see all these interesting parallels, man true to life parallels <laughs> popping off with the Kumsei and the tribes of Israel. <laughs> they always refer to the prophet and they try to say 
he was he was facing the charge of witchcraft. All right, so that means he had power, right? <laughs> that means he would be a magi, you know, like Moshe uh, splitting the waters. You know what I'm saying? Um, Joshua making the sun stand still, man. Our prestors had power, and to them, it, we must be sorcerers. We must be witches, right? So back to the Salem, Jerusalem, Salem witch, uh, witch hunt. You know, anything to do with Hebrew magic. They're trying to hunt it down, of course. Out of fear, most fearfully, did the prophet keep his resolution and by the rifle and flame destroyed upon the charge of witchcraft nearly all Delaware chieftains. And last time we got how these Delawares were involved in these treaties, such as Fort Wayne and them you know, against the Kumse, who calmly submitted to the judgment of the Kumse's brother as to the commands of a guy by this charge of witchcraft, El Skawatawa obtained a mass to destroy his enemies and few remain to revenge the imposture. So yeah, these are just little snippets into you know, some of the stuff they carry, you know, uh, carrying forward some of the ideas and the connections between these aborigines, these originals with the tribes of Moshe. The North aborigines believed in the first five books of Moses as read to them by the missionaries because their own religious customs and law are in direct analogy with them. So, the sorcery, the real sorcerers, these missionaries spreading this Christianity, they've already had their councils to form, you know, this religion that had a whole lot of analogy to do with the Tanakh, you know what I'm saying, with the Old Testament, right? Um, you know, enough so that it looked familiar, you know, to these originals, that it looked familiar. There was a familiar flow when you talk Moshe, you know, certain prophets were there that was familiar with them in India Superior. However, <laughs> let's go. So they found a lot of analogies and also the historical records of the Bible are in keeping with their own tradition. Their own traditions, however, never conveyed, never conveyed to them that the Savior had visited Earth body back for the illusion so this christianity of this jc coming to two thousand years ago for your sins man your indigenous traditions never conveyed that a savior had visited earth but that he was still to come so they pushed the timeline back and created the savior story and act like he came already right and said, come into the blood of J.C. He came already. I know you waiting on the Savior. According to this book, he came 2,000 years ago. But according to our book, we know they're holding crafty councils to cut us off from being a nation, right? We know we've been a long time without a con. We know that once we return, once Israel returns, for the children of Israel shall sit solitary many days, but afterwards shall they return. You seek the creator, you're back in cold. Then comes this Mashiach, then comes this shepherd, then comes your Dawi, your flow. You can't fool these tribes. Their own traditions never taught them about no savior that already came here. But they say, hey, there will be someone that is to come. <laughs> you know, you afterwards you seek Hawa and David the Khan. Talking end of days, they say it didn't happen yet. This is an end of days thing when you're talking this meshe, meshi. 
we know that a savior is to come or a Mashiach is to come because Hawa is our only savior. So Hawa is saving us no matter who Hawa sends. Hawa is our savior. But we know that our shepherd is to come. Jeremiah 30, verse 9, but they shall serve Hawa. And David, their king, to come, right? Whom I will raise up unto them. If we fear not, Jacob, my servant, don't be dismayed, my Nagas, O Israel. For lo, I will save you. Hawah is our savior. Although Hawah will raise up David unto them. Nah, they don't know about no JC, man. <laughs> but they know that uh, he was still to come, this Messiah. They said if the Mashiach had come, the Aborigines said, what well, if the Mashiach had come, we should have known it by his presence among us. We would know. You won't be telling us. We would know because we are Israel. And not merely from the words of another race of men. <laughs> we digging out the races of men, letting us know that these copper colored Nagas are the Israelites. So just know that if there was a Mashiach, we would know it. We won't be hearing it from you. That's common sense. We're talking to Kumse, right? That's common sense. <laughs> we, we won't have to hear from another race of men who simply tell us of his advent <laughs> or invention. You're going to tell us about this invention? For Hawa would not have left us for nearly 2,000 years without the important intelligence, man. <laughs> you think we'd be waiting around here for 2,000 years if our Mashiach had already come, man? Hawa would not have left us for nearly 2,000 years without the important intelligence of the Mashiach. <laughs> we have practice the general principles we we know the, the principles the code yeah we practice the general principles of what you call christianity among yourselves <laughs> we practice these principles among ourselves it may therefore be that manitao or hawa has inspired us for these thousand years with the correct spirit for we view his love and everything around us that is our continuous continual blessing but our continual curse is the preserving invasion persevering invasion of the white man or you know as these other nagas with these treaties Yeah, I can't make this stuff up. So <clears throat> he's saying, you know, look, man, uh, we know the principles that we share with your religion that you took from us. Uh, but you added something, this savior that came 2000 years ago, we would have known it, man. Our creator ain't going to have us around here being jammed up for 2000 years. It's the same thing we say in a day, but you mean he died for your sins. You've been getting jammed up for 2,000 years. If that's the case, you, you still in captivity? And he died for your sins 2,000 years ago? We don't have to hear from the hijack about this JC and Christianity. We would have known it already. They, we, we shouldn't have to thank our oppressor for our God, for bringing us our God. We got to thank the invader for bringing us our God. We got to thank the invasion of the white man for bringing the JC. Is that what you're trying to say, man? Or the invasion of the Moor for bringing us this hijack, man? Nah, man. The 
the king here alluded to was James the first of England, whom the Aborigines regard as the old chief. Whoa, because in his reign, the first firm settlement in North America took place in his reign. Wow. So which Aborigines? We ain't talking to Coon saying we must be talking, pushing it. <laughs> or uh, calling this guy the old chief. I mean, they're calling a lot of people chief, right? And we said James the first colonized Americas. And here's another substantiating source breaking down this King James Bible situation. This King James bringing you this New Testament. He's who we're talking about. You know, uh, this other race of man who's bringing us this savior that we would have known about if, uh, you know, Hawaii left us here for 2,000 years. We would have had that important intelligence. But old Jamesy connected with old Charlesy, connected with St. Stephen Esteban, as a more, it's all coming together. He's being called old chief, huh? James the first, King James is old chief now. Because in his reign, listen up, the first firm settlement of hijacks in North America took place. Which is why we showed you, you know, this longitude latitude he's putting on you. These patents for the land. We got to get back in that. Oh, we we got we to get back in that drop. My wave surfers already know we got to go back there. That King James drop, because that's when it all started. That's the first settlement of hijacks, man. We're talking Virginia, right? The Indians cannot understand the adventure and the spirit of discovery first brought the Cavaliers to Virginia that they would leave would leave of their own accord their native land and by casting aside the mantle of patriotism, assume the offense armor of the invaders. Offensive armor of the invaders. Wow, as love of country is next to love of God with the Aborigines, they have therefore ever regarded the European settlers as the bad children of a good father. <laughs> The bad children of a good father. This was the was confirmed in their minds when a portion of Virginia in the reign of James was used as but as botany bay. I don't think the Kumsa and them see these people as children of Hawaii at all, right? <laughs> but maybe the other side of Aboriginals, you know, maybe they you know, the ones calling James old chief, maybe they say, hey, well, they're just bad children of a good father. Wow. All right, man. So, so much drop coming out of this drop, man. <laughs> I've been barely flopping ahead a little bit, but go get the drop. And, and you know, all this is just reminding me of this curse, you know, because um, once you realize you've slaughtered and put genocide on Israel, then you know there's a curse that comes with that. You know, maybe we was in our own curse, but now you got your own to deal with, right? Yeah. I mean, it's your turn, man. You know, you've you, you seen us get uh, jammed up all this time, man, but Oh boy, is it your turn. All the nations or people in their aboriginal states seem to have had a belief in the existence of a good and bad demon or spirit. Thus in their uncivilized existence, they have offered adoration to a Supreme as if planted and their natures by the Almighty to prepare them for the reception of the revealed religion. <laughs> oh, it's already in them. They already got the drop over here. I wonder why. Maybe because G King James already had patents on the land and then 
remixed all the writings and formed this King James version. And then all these uh, analogies are formed and they say, wow, you guys know a lot about our book because it ain't your book. It's a hijack of what was already found here. The Aborigines of North America do not by any figure or sign personify the devil. So all this devil talk, <laughs> Managa, we by no figure, no sign, we had no personification of no devil here, man. Our devil is the ones that came to invade. They got us believing in the devil now, when they're the devil now, <laughs> when they've been the devil. Let's go. We're talking adversaries, right? And another part I was looking for was speaking about sacrifices and said, no, none of the Aborigines done no human sacrifice, you know, animals and all this other stuff, just like it, you know, said in the script in the old times, but nah, none of this human sacrifice, like all the stuff you heard about the original Nagas has been a complete lie, man. And they wanted to savage us up so that they wouldn't feel so bad so that the people, you know, migrating over here wouldn't feel so bad that they're migrating on the genocide of the Israelites, my knock. Wow. You built your fortune, you built your fame off the genocide of Israel. Man, I would hate to be you. Ooh, I would hate, I would hate to be the hijack in these days, knowing that you got this type of blood on your hands you slaughtered israel man even hitler was warning them against this he said look y'all don't know who y'all running up on those are the jewels of the creator man the jewels not the jews the jewels man oh boy While the brain was whirling to and fro, wondering at the majestic or the majesty of nature, the type of peace, the covenant between the Almighty and the children of the earth was seen in its double form and in its almost dazzling colors, forming a vast arc of hope over the dreadful gulf of storm and despair. My night, what are we talking about? We're talking about the rainbow sign of the covenant to the indigenous Nagas, to the Kum Sadim, just like it says in the book of Genesis, that it will be a sign of our covenant, the covenant Hawaii has with the entire living earth, man. And here's the part I was looking for with the flesh offerings. The biblical reader will at once be surprised even to conviction of the direct analogy in these great religious customs and those practiced by the ancient Israelites, huh? Right. This custom may seem most strange, but it is followed that a name shall not be lost in Israel, for it is evident that the tribes would be ceased, would have ceased long since, but for this custom, the captives upon being so incorporated with the tribe that made them prisoners have ever been faithful and have fought, have even fought against their former friends. Oh, we're talking about the more and more war their honor being stronger than their affections. Although this uncontaminated Aborigines will not marry with the European race, they consider all the tribes as of one great family. <laughs> Consequently, those intermarriages with the different tribes are not only sanctioned, but desired 
upon strong political as well as domestic reasons. Man, cut it out, man. They needed to marry into us, man. This is when you're getting, especially on the push Mataha side, his sister, his, you know, daughters and all that, you know, they're, they're going right into the hijack. You're going right into the hijack. <laughs> man. The death of the prophet by the hand of Melinda is in accordance with the Israel Indian custom that the murder of a parent shall die by the hand of the nearest kin. In the same sense, Melinda, in offering the altar knife to Tecumse to avenge his brother's death, if he fell from revenge and not injustice, says, quote, for ancient laws command thee as the nearest kin to take the blood that caused thy blood to flow eye for an eye so Tecumse had to avenge his brother's death the dying wish of Tecumse was strictly followed he was buried beside the old oak tree hundreds of the aborigines annually visit the mound of Tecumse, and if the Indian is seen to shed a tear, it is at the grave of that patriot, patriot chieftain. For a braver or nobler man than Tecumse never moved upon the battlefield. And I want you to remember this, because as we get back into this conversation at the council with Tecumse and Push Mataha, you know, that author there who was very much against the Kumse and very much for push. <laughs> He's gonna try to act like the Kumse ain't no real, no real soldier, you know. Oh, you know, maybe he didn't get the respect because, you know, uh, you know, what what wars were was he successful in? Like he's leading the rebellion. What do you mean? What wars are are you successful in? He's his only success comes in the complete extinguishing of the hijack he don't get success in a skirmish you know what i'm saying he's fighting everything man you don't measure <laughs> the bravery and the fierceness of a priest king by little skirmishes you know he is leading the tribe to unite his success comes in the unity when they don't unify he is doomed Push is not trying to unify all the tribes. He's trying to make sure his tribe is eaten. <laughs> his confederacy is eaten. That's the difference between Push and Tech. For a braver or nobler man than Tecumseh never moved upon the battlefield. What do you mean? Where's his uh, success on the battlefield? A braver or nobler man than Tecumse never moved upon the battlefield. Uttered words of fire in council. Or offered fervent prayers to the throne of the eternal. Who offered, you know, stronger words of fire in the council than Tech? Who offered more fervent prayers to Hawa, the throne of the eternal, than Tecumse, who moved upon the battlefield braver than Tecumse. Yeah, a lot of wild, man. Then you got this part here, the uh, biography goes into the land and history of General Harrison, President of the United States. In the Treaty of Washington, because Washington made the treaty with Push, Mataha, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, all these tribes, right? 1842. Yeah, man. 
skip ahead a little bit here. Like I said, man, this is so much work, you know. This is me skimming through it, you know what I'm saying? So just imagine how much, you know, you're going to find when you take your time. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to get as much as I can in on this great installation here, man, this installment here of the press investigation, man. But you, you know so much work here, and I wish I could get all this, man, man. Man, oh, man, it's a lot of work here. It's a lot of work here, man. You know, they're just talking about this General Wayne here in August 1793. He accompanied General Wayne in survive or surveying the spot where the city of Cincinnati now stands. For the purpose of erecting a frontier station, the plain was then covered with long lines and figures of embankments and early fortifications, the military ruins of a forgotten people, having no analogy with the Israel Indians Israel, Indians, my God, that's what they found here, the kingdom of Israel, Indians, India Superior, Preston, of the North or the Tyrian, Tyree Aborigines of Central or South America. This is not the place to unravel the mystery that is reserved for the history of the Western Hemisphere and a future volume of ancient America. <laughs> yeah, man, we got a mystery on our hands, man. This testimony by Harrison of their prowess uttered before his death, three years before his death, completely illustrates the general character of the Israel Indian manner of warfare. Let's, you know, let's dig on it. You know, before that it says, the Confederacy of the tribes in this conflict consists of the Wanadots, Delawares, Shawanos, Chippewas, Ottawas, Potawatomis, and the Miamis, Miamis. So everybody's involved. Now we're talking about the Israel Indian manner of warfare. To counteract their usual plan of operations, General Wayne adopted a novel mode for his own troops the same high authority as above quoted says in reference to wayne's policy the tactics which had been adopted for the american legion had been devised with a reference to all subtilities which those of the indians were well known to possess that means they're hella wise they're hella smart so they had to refer to all this wisdom that these indians already knew and try to navigate through it man and united the apparent it united the apparent opposite qualities of compactness and flexibility and faculty or facility of expansion under any circumstances in any situation which rendered utterly abortive the, the peculiar attack of the indians and in assailing the flanks of their adversaries the correctness of the theory which dictated this plan was proved in the trial and proved the truth in the sententious motto of a military society, even where Indians are the enemies. The Israel Indian warriors flushed with their late victory and total defeat of St. Clair commenced the battle with the most enthusiastic bravery and devotion. They were met for the first time by a policy founded on their own. They, however, succeeded in shaking the left wing of troops. This was observed by General Wayne, who instantly commanded young Harrison to speed to the spot and aid in forming them according to the plan of battle. And we're talking Indian Israel war <laughs> or, you know, Israel Indian warfare. And we'll just say, what's the question? It says, was this kindness forgotten by the foe? No, it became as a charm with the Israel Indian race. Hey, did you know there's an Israel Indian race? 
what what race are you? What cop of color race is found here are you, my naga? To guard the name of Harrison and thence, as will be shown, he became the most successful negotiator in the history of the nation for peace and amity, amity, friendship of peace and friendship with the aborigines of the North General Wayne in his official de dispatches to President Washington warmly acknowledged and testified to the military judgment and chivalric courage. Oh, man. They just kissing each other's behinds, right? They just kissing each other's behinds, right? Oh yeah, I want to talk this curse at the comb say, but you know, just so look. <laughs> Harrison's a big part of this. He he tribes up with Push Mataha, who's tried up with all these hijacks that are trying to make sure your name is no longer in remembrance, right? Back to the Fort Wayne situation, 1809, he formed a treaty with the Miami tribes for the purchase of lands upon the Wabash. We got that last time, get the drop. When these lands were about to be surveyed and opposition was made by the noblest patriot of the forest, Tecumse, who aided by the influence of his twin brother, the prophet, resolved to resist the continuing encroachments of the whites and all these hijacks. He consequently threatened the life of every chieftain who had signed the treaty. <laughs> then you got him going out against these Delawares, right? <laughs> to prevent this determination of Tecumse, General Harrison invited him to a council, which is where we picked it up last time. We're going to pick it up this time as well, which celebrated interview took place July 30, 1810 at Vincennes, the then capital of Indiana. The reader is referred to the Israel Indian, Israel Indian tragedy of the Kunse for the character of that interview and what which dramatic composition the author will indulge the hope, the efforts of his pen will not fail to reach the heart, arouse and sympathy, the noblest feelings of patriotic devotion. Man. For patriotism belongs not to the single nation or people but pervades every portion of the globe. The Kumse of, of Indiana, Philip of Pakanet, Pakanaket, present, present as noble themes for our lasting admiration of Camillus of Rome. All right. Miltaids of, Miltaids of Marathon. During the absence of the Kumse to the Southern tribes, right? He's trying to tribe up all these tribes the prophet of the West, here's where they try to smudge his name, he, ever envious of his brother warrior, resolved in defiance of the Pledge of Peace at the Council of Vincennes to provoke the whites. So now the prophet provoked the whites. Really, when he knew he was, you know, over, <laughs> overrun with all these numbers around him, he, he's just going to say, let me fight without my brother. Come on, man. He caused a number of encroachments on the frontiers and the deaths of many Delaware chieftains through a supposed possession of witchcraft. <laughs> so this prophet is, you know, hitting him with this magi flow, getting back on these Delaware chiefs for this uh, Fort Wayne and all these other treaties they signed. It. They're calling it witchcraft. He's, 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 he's putting that much work. <laughs> and such was the power of El Skawatawa that none of his victims offered any resistance either at the dreadful flames. Oh, he got the dragons popping off. <laughs> or when kneeling the bound at their graves to receive the rifle ball. The prophet also gathered many followers from several tribes and located himself at Tippecanoe on the Wabash. So all this was going down, going up, man. Right at this Tippecanoe point. So once you know that the press is over here, the British Museum got him over here 
1530, India Superior. <laughs> you see what all these Chicago Wars must be about. Leading up to 18, 11, 12, 13 is what we're talking about. And it continues for damn near 100 years or so after that, right? They're fighting at tip of canoe right here, right at the boundary of this uh, newly formed, you know, uh, Israel migration, Papano, who's teaming up with these Kentuckians and going to war against the tribes of Israel. Who? Everybody making this confederacy, hoping Israel don't return and seek Hawa and David their Khan. The tents of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Haggagites, man. So whether we're talking the Moabite flow, the noble Drew Ali, Canaanite getting everybody together against what? Oh, for their own, you know, um, place, their own flag, you know, their own uh, safety, navigating these United States of America treaties, this government stuff. We just want our things back because all these tents, we just talked about the Tyre, Tyrarians, <laughs> but Tyree, Philistia, children of Lot, Ishmael, Ishmael is my great. Indianapolis is the capital of, of, of all the Indians, man, right? So this is where they're used to meeting up at, is being hijacked. <laughs> Their power is being put on these places. Their mech is being, you know, annually done. And typical new X marks the spot is right there in the mix. Wabash is right here. We talked about the glaciation lines. Last time, these glaciation lines, we said, what is these glaciers even doing here? We got on the Little Ice Age. We said, oh, because the Little Ice Age took place during the European colonization of the America. So during the invasion comes an Ice Age, my knife. Historians agree that, the, that it was one of the coldest time periods in the last 1,000 years, not 100 years, my knife. 1,000 years is the coldest time. It's cold as a mug. <laughs> These people come over here and are in the plague, man. Ahmad didn't appreciate it, man. So many Nagas dying. Drought was also a huge problem in North America. That we were in a drought. We were in a famine. It was the coldest time period in the last thousand years. And the settlers arrived in Roanoke during the largest drought in the past 800 years. The coldest time in a thousand years and the largest drought in 800 years? Because of what? Because <laughs> of what? Oh, well, remember, several causes have been proposed. And the one that makes the most sense is this decrease in the human population because of the epidemics emerging in the Americas upon European contact. The decreases in Nagas comes from the war on the Nagas. And it led into an ice age that I believe might even be responsible for the Antarctic ice wall. Because don't act like they weren't feeling this stuff in Antarctica. I mean, they felt it everywhere else. North America felt it. Mesoamerica felt it. <laughs> right? Asia felt it. Africa felt it. Antarctica felt it. The Simple Dome had a climate event with an onset time that is coincident with that of the little ice age. And come on, man. What's up? What's up? We're just talking glaciation, right? The path and direction of the annual annual migration of the Ishmaelites. They did this annually. It said it was 380 miles. Spring, summer, fall, they, they, they out of here. But the winter, probably not, because it was just so cold. <laughs> so cold. Come on, man, how they migrating while we at war, man? You know, we getting, you know, 
displace, but this ain't no, oh, let's just migrate and set up and set up Morocco, right? <laughs> Holy Mountain Harmonics, right? Fort Wayne, 30 million acres given up around this area. 30 million acres. The prophet gathered many tribes, many followers from several tribes, located himself at Tippecanoe. The burning and the massacre of the Delaware chieftains drew forth a red monstrous from General Harrison. So he wanted his get back because he was tribed up with these Delaware. Man. The letter is embodied in the tragedy of Tecumseh. The gathering of the Indians on the Wabash being continued, General Harrison, commander-in-chief of the troops of the state, marched with his volunteer cavalry and infantry volunteer because all of these confederacies were joining up. All these Moors were joining up voluntarily to check incursions and violations of peace in the absence of Tukum Say, who had promised the amity of his tribe until the return to his return from the South. After the, they didn't want him to return with all these Nagas from the South. This is like Avatar, except Avatar, they tribed up and they beat the hijack at the end. These Nagas couldn't do that, right? Because of these treaties. If Avatar was truthful, all them other tribes that they that they got would have said, no, nah, we got a treaty, and they would have fought against, you know what I'm saying, the <laughs> main tribes of Avatar, man. They would have been tribe on tribe fighting each other. After a toilsome march, the army arrived opposite the settlement of Tippecanoe. Yeah. And you know the rest. Slaughter. Slaughter at Tippecanoe. Wow. Can't say no clearer than this. Can't say no clearer than this. General Harrison instantly commanded the watch fires to be extinguished, the cavalry to retire behind a hill between the town of Tippecanoe and the concealed foes, thus cutting off the retreat to their settlements as dawn should approach. Which soon began in the misty east to indicate its gray and cold advance. Assisted by the gradual daylight, the attack now by the troops took place and the battle became general which was continued by the descendants of Israel with the greatest fury. This is why we're going so hard, my naga, and this is why they mad, son. They wrote upon the children of Israel and we kept fighting. They wrote upon the children of Israel and the children of Hashirah kept fighting. They called us Shikamagwa. We didn't call ourselves that. They called us the Babars, but we know those are the Swan Knights. <sighs> the Kumse was rocking with the Seminole, rocking with the Cree, trying to tribe with the rest because we knew what would happen. All this is us. All this is us. All this is us. Vietnam War, wouldn't be surprised if that was still us. Now they got their Cold War. Now we in present times, my nigga. Afghanistan, now you want to talk? Pakistan, now you want to talk? Middle East? Nah, man, that's a front. They've been at war with the tribes the whole time. We got so much more drive. 
digging on this press to flow, this priesthood that we're talking about. We're talking about the descendants of Israel that they went to war against, man. Assisted by the graduate daylight, the attack now by the troops took place and the battle became general, which was continued by the descendants of Israel with the greatest fury. With the greatest fury, you fought back. The encounter in many parts of the deadly field being man to man. Let's go. So, <laughs> interesting thing, man. I'm just surfing the wave. They talking about the curse of the Kum say, Let's get a couple minutes here, man. The curse was declared at a time of signs and wonders in the heavens. Right? You got the Kum says comet. You got the 1833 media storm. You got. Just signs and wonders popping off. You got the ice age popping off, the glacier, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> glacial lines, man. You got everything happening. Let's go. The curse was issued from Indiana. <laughs> Confederacy of what? Uh, of the lost tribes of Israel. chosen ones who have been given this promise by the master of life having need of nothing and thankful for everything life was paradise into the serpent into the garden a serpent named William Henry Harrison the Masonic governor of an all Indian treaty. The leader of these tribes was called the Kumse, the Panther Comet, we're talking meteor storms, we're talking Prestus, who declared his people's desire to be separate. He wanted to be separate. He broke away. He didn't want to sign no deals. He didn't want no treaties. Federal Masonic troops. Well, they had other plans, right? Harrison claimed that this land must be secured to establish the throne of the true religion, Freemasonry. Thus, the noble savage was driven far from the promised land by Masonic long knives. They drove you out of the promised land, man. Harrison was indeed possessed by the serpent. This coward waited until the leader to come say was away. Harrison set up an assassination to justify <laughs> the invasion. Indianapolis, using his aide, Colonel Owen, as the bait, who was mistakenly shot while on Harrison's horse. And so they, they switched it up, made it seem like he was Harrison. He got shot. Harrison destroyed the religious capital and desecrated the graves. 
with the Kumsay saw what Harrison had done. He decreed the curse against the presidents, <laughs> against the hijacks. Starting with the ninth president. And on and on we go. Now consider this the 100 year coincidence. Harrison and Roosevelt both die. <laughs> All right, so Harrison. They going quickly, but you know, they want to get into these assassinations and different things, man. Just know <laughs> whether he spoke a curse or not, it was going to happen because of who they were fighting. It's one thing for Hawa to curse his people. It's another thing for you to curse Hawa's people. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it was okay because of greed, because of pride, because of hatred. And now you're dealing with it. These copper Indians are the lost tribes of Israel, headed by Preston John. Does North America even exist, man? <laughs> I mean, you know, people who flew airplanes, driven thousands of miles, not seen anything to confirm. I've seen actual places, but I have not, I did not see the entire planet from above. I mean, we don't know what this place looks like. But according to these maps, there ain't no North America. So this should let you know that Columbus, uh, he found the greater India. He found the greater India. Your home. So when they rode up on the Israelites, when you got this Israel-India connection, you also got an Israel-Asia connection, right? Florida-Asia. Florida-Asia Cathay. Ganges, Kanka. Kanka Key. Oh, boy, that might be a key right there. Khan. Ka key might be a key right there. From George Washington to the chiefs of the Choctaw Nation, 17th of December, 1789, to the chiefs of the Choctaw Nation. Brothers, I have sent Major Daughtry, Daughty, one of you, our warriors, in order to convince you that the United States will remember the treaty they made with your nation four years ago at Hopewell on the Kiawe Guard and protect him and show him the places at which trading posts shall be established. So, President future president, right? George Washington. Who at this time, well, let's see, by command of the president. So he was president at this time. Okay. <laughs> Him and Push popping off. Push, Washington and Harrison sitting in the tree. Doing treaties. You say, hey, I sent one of our guys to you. Make sure you show them where all the trade posts should be. We're setting up shop. And when the said post shall be established, support them to the utmost of your power. Make sure Tecumse and him, you know, Shikamagua don't jam us up. Protect us from the Shikamagua. Be attentive to what he shall say in the name of the United States, for he will speak only truth. 
regard the United States as your firm and best friend, <laughs> best support, right? Talking to uh, the chiefs of the, of the Choctaw. Keep bright the chain of friendship between the Chickasaws and your nation. Reject the advice of bad men who may attempt to poison your minds with suspicions against us, United States. Don't let nobody turn you against us. Don't let them call. Don't 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 let them call us the hijack. Don't let them call us the authority, the popo. Don't let them call us the enemy, the invader. Reject the advice of those bad men who may attempt to poison your minds with suspicions against the United States. The United States. Given under my hand and seal at the city of New York the 17th day of December, 1789. George Washington. Don't let them poison your minds. <laughs> Managa, this is Treaty 101. Treaty 101. We can start seeing uh, his story a lot clearer. I mean, this is kind of a fun, uh, just wave surf, man. Just popped up in the search, man. But I don't know, man. Could be something, could be nothing, man. Uh, Push Mataha, chief of the Choctaw Nation, is Walkoos, all right? Thomas Parker, founder of the Natawa. Corral or old Corral's grandsons, wife, great grandmothers, husbands, nephew, ex part. <laughs> so they try to break it down. It's Push Mataha Thomas Parker, man. I don't know. You know, in Genie, <laughs> he pops up. It's Walkoos. Brian Thomas Parker. You know, again, yeah, could be something, could be nothing, man. But we'll, you know, start looking into this, this Piqua. You know what I mean? Uh, his wife is of the Piqua Shawnee. Interesting, right? You know, there's something that popped up. I'll leave the link for you. This link is also good, goes into some of the, you know, uh, sisters and siblings or unknown siblings of Pushmataha. Certain other possibilities as we narrow down, you know, more about the more and more war, man. Who's, whose daughters are going where, man? Who's, whose sister was married to who, right? all culminating in the War of 1812. Yeah, it's a lot of drop here, <laughs> as you can see, for you to dig on. Talking about the chief or Choctaw, Push Mataha. And, you know, I was looking more into this Hushi Yukpa, you know, just, just searching in there. Oh, man. So this is supposed to be the, of course, this ain't the real image of Push, but, you know, his response to the Kumse. say, listen to me, you have come here as you have often gone elsewhere with a purpose to involve us peaceful people in unnecessary trouble. <laughs> so you already know his aim. We say our people have no undue friction with the whites <laughs> because we have, no, we have had no leaders stirring up strife to serve their selfish personal ambitions. You hear me say our people are peaceful people. They make their way not by ravaging upon their neighbor, but an honest toil. <laughs> In that regard, they have nothing 
in common with you. I know your history. You are a disturber. You're a troublemaker. Oh, man. Talking down on this Israelite, huh? You have stirred up strife between different tribes of your own race. Not only that, you are a monarch. What? Like a king? An unyielding tyrant within your own dominion. Every shining man, woman, and child must bow in submission to your imperious will. Mm. Like the kings of Israel, huh? So these tribes were just tired of being under Judah, right? They, they, they're just tired of being under Israel, right? They have no monarchs. We don't got no king. Ain't nobody over us. <laughs> the chieftains do not undertake the mastery of their people, but rather they are the people's servants elected to serve the will of the majority. The majority has spoken on this question and it has spoken against your contention their decision has therefore become the law of the Cherokees of Choctaw and he gave this speech you know after a previous longer speech you know where they his people are agreeing with him right so push Mataha will see that the will of the majority so recently expressed recently because it just happened when they put the tomahawks in the air is rightly carried out to the letter. If after this decision, any Choctaw should be so foolish as to follow your imprudent advice and enlist to, to fight against the Americans, you fight against these whites, man, you're going to die. Simple and plain. And this is why George Washington is bigging up this dude. And this is why Harrison and them is, is bigging them up, man, because that's the Confederacy. They can't fight against Harrison. They can't fight against Washington. And even to this day, they can't come fight by your side, according to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. You made your choice. You elected to fight with the British. The Americans have been our friends, and we shall stand by them. We will furnish you safe conduct to the boundaries of this nation as properly benefits the dignity of our of, our, of your office. Farewell, Takum said. You will see Push Mataha no more until we meet on the faithful war path. So from that point on, it was all the way up. From that point on, it was war on Big Takum said. Managa, these, these hijacks are so confused, man. They even named themselves after Takum said. <laughs> They're naming themselves after big tech, my noggin. I mean, you you tell me this makes sense. I mean, I mean, they just confused. So this General Sherman is also William Tecumseh Sherman, right? So who names him after the great Tecum? Who names this hijack after Tecum? So they conquer you and then they take your names, right? They take your titles, man. History go down, he gonna be Tecumseh. 2,000 years from now, he's Tecumseh. <laughs> They just take everything, right? So you read about it. I can't even read about this jabroni, man, but, you know, he's another uh, full-blown warpath hijack, right? Named after Tecumseh. You got the Battle of Thames, you know, this is where Tecumseh was killed and his confederacy largely fell. British troops under Major General Proctor had occupied Detroit until the United States Navy gained control of Lake Erie, cutting them off from their supplies. Proctor was forced to retreat north up the Thames River to Morvian Town. Here we go. <laughs> Here goes another more town, followed by the tribal confederacy under shining leader Tecumseh, who were his allies, American infantry and cavalry leader, Major General William Henry Harrison, drove off the British and then defeated the indigenous people who were demoralized by the death of Tecumseh in action. American, American control was reestablished re in the, the Detroit area. The tribal confederacy collapsed and Proctor was court-martialed for his poor leadership because he didn't even have a plan for retreat. He's over there trying to retreat. He got his wife and kids. He got everybody's kid, you know, <laughs> you 
Nevertheless, Proctor could not defend Fort Amherstburg, and there was no food and guns had been removed from the fort. They had no food, Managa. They had no weapons. Guns had been removed from the fort to be mounted on Barclay ships. He began to retreat up the Thames River. September 27th, the Kumse had no option but to go with him. Proctor apparently agreed to a compromise to retreat only as far as Moravian town, a settlement of Lenape Indians who had migrated from the United States. This was the highest na navigable point of the river, so it was safe from outflanking moves by river. Also, some supplies could be brought there overland <clears throat> with Burlington Heights. Although the roads were very poor, however, Proctor made no attempt to fortify this position. The British retreat was badly managed, which is why it was court-martialed, and the soldiers had been reduced to half rations. Proctor left the main body of the army under command of Colonel Augustus Warburton of the 40, 41st Regiment without orders. He, he left this man without orders while he led the retreat accompanied by his wife and family. So he's looking out for his own wife and family and the other women in dependence and his personal baggage. The British soldiers were becoming increasingly demoralized and the Coombsay's warriors grew ever more impatient with Proctor for his unwillingness to stop and fight. So at no point did he want to fight. He had no guns. He had nothing. He just was running and he had his wife and children with him, man. What kind of sense is this making? We're making a dismount, but you see how pathetic this was handled, man. And this led to the death of Tecumseh. See, William Henry's forces, man, he had 3,500 people, infantry, cavalry, small detachments of regulars, 27 U.S. infantry, five brigades of Kentucky, which we know <laughs> Ishmael was migrating right there, right? 63-year-old governor of Kentucky and hero of the American Revolutionary War. He also had a 1,000 volunteer. More. So that's 4,500 people, man. All right. At least. Now, Proctor on the British side, right, have 800 soldiers. <laughs> All right. Some veterans of the... Regiment's 1st Battalion had been serving in Canada since 1803 and had suffered heavy casualties in several engagements in 1813, including the Battle of Lake Erie, where more than 150 of his men had served aboard Barclay ships. They had been reinforced by the young soldiers of the 2nd Battalion. Most of the regiment's officers were dissatisfied with Proctor's leadership but Colonel Warburton, the next in seniority, refused to countenance any move to remove him from command. The Kumse led about 500. <laughs> so he had 500 knives with him. This dude had 4,500 people with him, uh, five brigades of Kentucky's militia, and a bunch of other volunteers, right? Wow. <laughs> Since the Kumse and his followers remained and carried on fighting, Colonel Johnson charged into the Indian position at the head of 20 horsemen to draw attention away from the main American force. But the Kumse and his men answered with a volley of musket fire that stopped the cavalry charge. 15 of Johnson's men were killed or wounded. Johnson himself was hit five times and his main force became bogged down in the swamp mud. The Kumse is believed to have been killed during this fighting. So he made one last stand. They retreating, you know, they trying to save the children, save the wives, save everybody. They make one last stand, man, in this horribly managed retreat, you know what I'm saying, from those that they thought were allies. 
the main force finally made it through the swamp and James Johnson's troops were free from their attack on the British. So they had him for a minute and then here comes the other uh, infantry. The American reinforcements were converging as news spread of the death of the Kumse and Indian resistance dissolved. Richard Mentor Johnson was credited with shooting to Kumse, although the evidence is unclear. William Whitley, a Revolutionary War veteran, is also quite credited with killing. So everyone's credited with killing the man. Gotcha. Let's go. Mm -hmm. 